got an employee who's off sick long term. How do you deal with it? What do you do? What steps do you take? Hello, my name's Jennifer. I'm the founder of Silk Helix. We are a HR consultancy that will protect your business, train your business, and help you grow your business. And in this video, I'm gonna tell you exactly how you can deal with long-term sickness absence. So let's get started with exactly what is long-term absence. Long-term sickness absence doesn't have a legal definition, but the NICE guidelines um, recommend that we look at four weeks as being a definition for long-term absence. So any absence that gets to four weeks and goes beyond that, we would generally call long-term. Occasionally, you might have a different definition that you use within your business, so it's absolutely okay. Just make sure that you're using that consistently. And it's so important that we manage long-term absence, both in terms of being able to reduce the length of the absence and to avoid it happening in the first place. And managing long-term absence isn't just about managing the absence when it happens. A lot of it happens before absence even starts to occur. I did have a client once who weren't a client of mine, became a client of mine and suddenly said, and we've got this person that has been off work for four years and we haven't spoken to them. How do we deal with them? Can we just get them off the payroll? And the answer was, no, you can't just get them off the payroll and they've been accruing holiday for that time as well. There's now a bit of a cap in terms of holiday accrual over um, 18 months, but at the time there wasn't. So it's expensive to keep people on your payroll. It's expensive even if you're not paying them, you're still gonna be accruing holiday that you're gonna have to pay. On top of that, you're still now going to have to go through a process. You're going to have to get in touch with them. You're going to have to go through all this process to try and deal with it. So don't leave it four years. Don't even leave it three weeks before you get in touch with somebody for the first time when dealing with long-term sickness absence. So I guess that's the first myth that we can't contact people when they're off sick. It is a complete myth and it's a really dangerous one for business because it makes it so hard to deal with absence if we're not talking to people. We always say that on the first day of absence, somebody should call in sick. And we would usually say that they then call in every subsequent day. Now, if we know they're gonna be off for a week, we may say, okay, call us in two or three days time, let us know how you're getting on. If we get a sick note for four weeks, we may say, okay, let's have a chat in two weeks and see how you're getting on. We've got to keep up that communication. We've got to get it started. We've got to make it a norm right from the beginning and make it really clear. Am I going to call you? Are you going to call me? Is there a time? Is there a kind of, you'll do it roughly around this day or is it on this day at this time? Just be really clear about what the expectations are and what your plans are. Ideally, this will be the line manager because the line manager will have the best relationship with somebody. But if that relationship's broken down, perhaps that's partly the reason for this sickness absence. Perhaps we're dealing with work-related stress. Then it may be somebody from HR or a more senior manager manager that gets involved and has those conversations. You're not going to be able to build relationships at this point. It's gone wrong for whatever reason, whether that's something that's genuinely happened to this individual outside of work, nothing to do with work, and they've hit their worst times. They're on long-term sick. It's We're not in a good place. Or is it work-related? It's work-related stress, for example, and things have gone wrong with relationships in the workplace. Either way, something's going wrong at this point, and we're not going to be able to build those relationships now. And it's why it's so important to have good relationships with your team, to have good open communication, because that way, when we get to this worst point, they're much more likely to be open with us, to be honest with us, to communicate with us, because they're used to that, because they know what they're going to get when they're open and honest and communicate. Once somebody has got to their eighth day of absence, you should be receiving a statement of fitness for work signed by a GP or another medical professional to state why the person is off. And this will either say that they're not fit for work, or it may say they may be fit for some work and give some adjustments that could be made that would enable them to be fit. If adjustments are recommended, we do recommend that you look into that and look at whether or not you can accommodate them. If you can't, then it will revert to a sick note. They'll be too sick to work. If you can, that's great. And if it suggests a phase return, I strongly recommend that you do accept phase return and you go with it. Forgive the quick interruptions to this video and I will keep it really quick. If you've liked this video, found it useful, you can of course hit the subscribe button, but I also want to tell you about our digital courses. In our digital courses, I go into much more detail. The videos are very similar to these. It's me, it's on camera, but there's also downloads, there's sample forms, there's a few sample policies in there as well. All the things that you need to know. We've even got some coming where we've got live classes as well. So check out our digital courses. Details are on screen now and in the description below. Look forward to seeing you on one of our courses in the future. And in the meantime, I'll let you get back to the video.
Exactly the steps that we take when we're managing long-term absence is going to depend on the situation that somebody's in. Long-term absence could include somebody that's off for six weeks, let's say with a broken leg, and we know that they're told that after six weeks they'll be able to come back to work and things will pretty much be okay. In those situations, we may well just keep in touch with them and plan for their return, plan for any phased return they need, plan for any adjustments that they might need. So they may need some adjustments. They're starting finishing time so they can commute at quieter times for a little while. They may need some shorter days. They may need some working from home. We would look at all of that as part of a return to work plan. Now that's gonna be a really simple one. We may have somebody who's off long-term sick and actually we don't really know what's wrong. They're undergoing tests or they had a diagnosis, but we're not sure whether or not the treatment's going to work. These can be much more complex situations, and we are judging on a case-by-case -case basis what the individual says. Keeping that contact is therefore so important, because in these cases, that contact means that we get an update on, well, what's the latest tests they've had? What's the latest treatment? What's the prognosis now? Is there any more clarity on what's likely to happen? because we need to decide whether and when we get medical reports. It's likely with long-term sickness absence that we are going to be looking to get medical reports. Now that could be from their GP, it could be from their consultant, it could be that we go to our own occupational health. And occupational health providers are available for small businesses and large companies have got their own internal occupational health. There's lots of external providers that small businesses can use and they can be really useful to get an insight into somebody's health condition and how to deal with that in the workplace. And bear in mind, GPs often aren't the experts in this. Occupational health is specifically trained to look at the impact of that health condition on somebody's day-to-day, -day, including their ability to be at work. If somebody is undergoing tests to find out what's wrong with them, or they've just started treatment, it's unlikely that any medical report, whether that's GP, consultant, occupational health, is gonna be worthwhile at this stage. It's likely that report's simply gonna say, we're doing the tests and until we know what's wrong, we won't be able to give you an answer, or until this treatment is finished, we won't know whether or not it's worked and therefore we can't give you an answer. There's gonna be a cost to these reports, so, don't just go getting them because somebody's off for four weeks, get them because it's worthwhile. There's one of two things that we're looking for in these reports. We're either looking for what reasonable adjustments we can make to help somebody get back to work, what we can do to support them to get back to work, or we're looking for something that says, actually this person is not going to get back to work in a reasonable time frame, and therefore we may need to dismiss them. Now it's likely that we're gonna be looking at 12 months or more for somebody to be off before we consider dismissing them. Generally, we wouldn't dismiss before that unless we've got some real evidence that this person is just not going to get better. A degenerative condition, for example, where somebody isn't going to work again and we're being told this by medical professionals might be where we can dismiss sooner than the 12 months. Either way, any entitlements to sick pay, whether that's statutory or occupational sick pay, should be taken into account before we dismiss. They should get those entitlements before we consider dismissing. Given that if we said we'll pay occupational sick pay, let's face for six months, then we're saying that we would accept six months of absence. Also, if you've got permanent health insurance, do bear in mind that that may pay out and therefore we may not be able to dismiss because that will take away their entitlements to the permanent health insurance. So do bear that in mind as well when we're considering all of the things that we would do with somebody who is off long-term sick. So the key thing is, is that we're regularly having communication and meetings with people, whether that's on the phone or we're actually meeting with somebody, we may do home visits. It may be the best and only way that we can actually get good communication with somebody is to visit them in their home. And in these situations, we would invite them to have a family member, somebody with them, to make sure that they feel safe and that they feel like this is a comfortable environment. And these meetings shouldn't be torturous. They shouldn't be an interrogation. It's a friend going to visit. You're going to find out how they are. Perhaps you're taking a box of chocolates and some flowers with you. Make sure that you are opening up that communication, recognizing that they're in a vulnerable situation right now. They're in a really hard situation and we are trying to support them whilst also trying to work out what we're gonna do as a business, how we're gonna cover the work, how long we're we likely to be covering it for, 
are we gonna to need to get to a dismissal? These are all the questions that we're asking and we're trying to find out through that communication. If somebody is really poorly and unable to talk to us, and that could be for mental health reasons, it could be for physical health reasons, then we could agree that that communication is done through a, a relative, somebody or a friend, somebody who can communicate on their behalf just to update us and let us know what's happening so that we can be kept sort of in the loop of, of what's going on for the individual. Once we're getting to a point of either knowing that we're starting to look at this person coming back to work, so we're starting to look at they may be recovering and therefore we need to plan their back to work. We start to put those plans in place. That's where we can definitely be getting a medical report. Occupational health, really useful at this point to help us work out what reasonable adjustments that we might need to make. On the other side of that coin, if we're looking at somebody who's not recovering, where progress isn't being made, then we may be looking to a dismissal. So we may be looking at, are we saying there isn't work available? Are we saying they cannot come back to work? And again, we may need to be going to occupational health, their GP, their consultant, it may be the occupational health rights to the GP or consultant and they bundle it all together. It may be that we write to, to the consultant or GP first and then look at whether or not we need an occupational health after that. But we need to be satisfied that we've got significant evidence that they are not going to come back to work before we get to a point of dismissal. We need to make sure we've looked at any reasonable adjustments. So if it's a possibility that they could come back to work, but with a lighter workload or part-time basis, we need to look at whether those are options that we can consider before we make that decision to dismiss. Also take into account whether you've got any death in service benefits. I know it's something we don't really want to mention or talk about, but if that is a possibility, we need to take that into account. And also we might want to take into account ill health retirements. If your pension scheme allows for ill health retirement, again, that might be something that we take into account with the individual when we're discussing dismissal. If we are getting to dismissal, don't forget that's going to be a formal dismissal. So we need to have a formal dismissal meeting. We need to write to them to make sure that they know that this dismissal may well be coming. And often by the time we've got to this point, they are expecting it. They know that this is likely to happen because we've had all that communication as as we go through. And finally, don't forget, it will be a dismissal with notice. We do need to pay out that notice period. If you are dealing with a long-term absent situation, I do recommend that you take specific advice because they are complex situations, but I hope that this video has given you a useful overview into the process. If you have found it worthwhile, hit that like button, the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss a single one of our videos that come out every Tuesday at six o'clock.